very responsive investor to try to move quickly in decision making. Um, and we have used all the tools in our toolkit to try to support both our portfolio, but also the economies in which we are investing. So if I can just describe the, the COVID response structure that we've put in place, the strategy has three pillars. The first is preserve, and it's really focused around preserving the impact that we've sought to create in our investments and preserving the value in the companies that we've supported with our investments. So that's about our existing portfolio today. You want to keep those businesses in business that you've been investing in and supporting for a long time. That's right. The second is strengthen, and that is really about utilizing investment in our um, in our portfolio or beyond our portfolio to support the response to COVID-19. And whether that's through financial intervention and your poll just asked, is it about flexible capital? So one of the pillars of the strength and piece of our strategy is systemic liquidity, putting capital into the markets with different target end beneficiaries in mind into different geographies through different intermediaries, but basically trying to put capital out there. And the other piece is really focused on healthcare and basic needs with a focus on food security, water, and sanitation. We're going to get into all of those topics uh, as we go. I just want to let everybody know those are really important themes about access to capital. What are the, what's, if you're a business owner, how do you get capital today? What's the picture you're experiencing? And then obviously the, the immediate needs around health and food in many of these countries where you have large informal economies, people can't, can't get out easily to get food. How, what do we do about it? And they don't have income. Uh, but go ahead, Yasmin, tell, tell, tell us more what you're seeing from the business standpoint. What are businesses experiencing today? Well, so um, you also asked about guidance on job protection, and it was interesting to see the response on the survey there being quite low. Um, I, I'd be interested, actually, in the demographic that's voting in that in that poll to see kind of what's the perspective that's reflecting that. Um, actually, guidance on job protection was one of the first things that CDC was able to put out. So we've been using our capital, but also we have non-financial ways to support our portfolio. And... Um, we had 400 people participate in a webinar on protection, job protection guidance recently. So I think there is quite a lot of demand for, for guidance on how to manage in a time where retrenchment is likely to be an experience that you know, uh, many companies need to go through. How do you do retrenchment responsibly? Is there a way to avoid retrenchment by say, you know, rebalancing work staff or workflow in some way? Um, so I think those are key questions. Um, there are questions about how do you shift the way the company is capitalized with either rescheduling debt repayments. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of flexibility, whether it's on the capital side or the, or the workforce side. And yeah, companies who might have thought they had flexibility, they might have thought their balance sheet was strong, they had money in the bank, they were ready for anything. They didn't expect this. They didn't expect uh, to be yeah. shut down for so long. And maybe that's a good a good moment to bring in Vipul to the discussion. Vipul, your, your business is right at the center of this. Um, you know, many businesses are affected, of course, every business basically, but, but you're yeah. right at the center because you're delivering food to people who need it. Tell us more about Big Basket and what you're seeing right now. Yeah, absolutely. Like you said, this was a bit of a tsunami. I think it caught all of us a little unawares. And in India, particularly, the lockdown was very sudden. It got announced with about four hours of notice to the whole country. In fact, a lot of chief ministers in states uh, sort of complained that they got to know on TV, which is a funny part of it. But that gave a lot of businesses like us very little time to prepare. And uh, one of the first things, therefore, that happened was uh, there was panic buying. People just wanted to buy, stock up, hoard. So that the demand just went through the roof. On the other side, uh, most of the people left because people were scared. They wanted to get back home. Uh, the state borders and the city borders got locked down. Communities closed down because everybody was you know, sort of uh, getting into a very protectionist uh, kind of mode. And therefore, uh, if you had, normally if you had 100 people, we are down to 30. And so in that situation where you know, we had one third of uh, people and demand, which was 10X, it, it just became absolutely impossible. Uh, and, to fig and to figure out uh, what's happening on the government side, would they allow us to operate? Would they give us permissions to uh, actually deploy and uh, go and deliver stuff? Uh, because they said, you, know, you, you need to have passes, you need to get, uh, apply for these passes uh, to the government. Uh, you need to download them in some cases from e-portals. In some cases, you have to physically send people to a particular office and get those passes. And those were limited. So that sort of constrained how many passes you could get. So it, it was very, you know, uh, absolutely anarchic for about uh, a week or so. And I think, uh, so it took us some time to really even understand what was happening, uh, to come to grips with the situation. 
And then I think, uh, so it gave us uh, two, three quick lessons. And if I may just touch on them briefly, one was sure. you need to work with government and, and which we had never done in the past, uh, being fairly self-reliant and never, uh, our, our whole thesis was don't go anywhere near the government and I think you're good on your own. And so we had to learn how to reach out to them. We had to reach out at the prime ministerial office level. We had to reach out to the local governments, the local district magistrates, the local police uh, people. So we actually formed a task force just to communicate and liaise with government. And he said, this is the most critical part, just getting them to understand why is it critical for us to operate? What service do we provide? We are providing essential food services, which are extremely critical to people under this uh, particular environment. So they, it's useful for them to actually work with us and get this done. So I think that was one critical learning. How do you work with government? How do you co-opt government? And how do you get them to see your point of view and, and become supporters? So that was the first learning we had and that sort of got us started. And then from there we have, uh, the second learning was how do you build people back? How do you bring people back? How do you ensure them it's safe to operate? How do you make sure that, you know, that was the second big challenge. And and, and maybe I'll talk about it a little more as you go along, but uh, some yeah. really interesting learnings during this well, period. Yeah, I mean, as far as I understand, there's still a lot of uh, questions, right, about the lockdown in India. I think it's it's meant yeah. to be lifted May 18th, but there's still yes. some questions about whether that will actually happen. Um, so uncertainty is something, you know, people and businesses are dealing with all over the world, and, and many governments themselves are dealing with uncertainty. Right. I guess I'm curious to know, you're talking about your own uh, employees, getting them out right. was hard. Right. What about right. the supply chain? What about the farmers producing the products? Um, the small factories and others creating packaged products. What about the whole supply chain that you rely on? Yeah. What's your experience been like uh, in India yeah. during this crisis? That got completely disrupted. So small manufacturer, for example, had the same problem we had. Their people left. In fact, most manufacturing staff in India is migrant labor. And so those people just went back to the villages. They went back to their towns and cities where they hailed from and sort of just locked themselves down. And one of the things the government did was they said, you know, uh, everybody will get paid their salaries for the next till this lockdown goes down all employees have to pay their salaries and this was an advisory uh, saying that you need to pay salary so people are not worried about getting the salaries back so there was no incentive for anybody to really go back and work so most of the small manufacturers that you work with lost uh, their their uh, you know workforce so they were in no position to supply in fact one of the arguments that we made to the government was that you know if you want farmers to have access to market if you want manufacturers to have access to market to sell their unsold inventory, the only people who's, who are going to buy from them today and ship them across are people like Big Basket. Because traditionally farmers would go to actually a, a market and sell it, or they would actually ship it themselves. But now they don't have the resources. They don't have the permissions to actually traverse state boundaries. They can't even uh, you know, enter cities. So how do you actually uh, uh, make sure that they don't go out of business? So one of the first things we did was to actually go back to uh, governments and tell them, give us permission to make sure that we pick up from our farmers, allow us to operate those interstate or intrastate trucks across so we can make sure that the farm output keeps getting back to market. And so that permission we got very quickly because I think the government was responded to alacrity. They realized this was a critical uh, measure. And so we could quickly get farm supplies moving. And that fortunately has actually stayed the course. It's helped us a lot. It's helped customers a lot. And uh, that uh, part of supply that's, chain. That's got to be a that's yeah. got to be a huge shift for your business to to now Absolutely. suddenly having trucks go directly to farmers, picking up Absolutely. produce, bring it to your to, into your uh, facilities, distribution centers, getting it out to people really quickly. Because I want to go to Jean Paul Adam sure. to hear about the um, the situation in Africa. Just give people a sense of how large is Big Basket? How many customers in India are you serving? Uh, so we are we are in about thirty cities in India. We do about uh, about seven eight million orders a month uh, today. And uh, so we are the uh, the fourth largest grocery business in the country. Yeah, so you're a significant business. You're, you know, Amazon is Absolutely. one of your competitors in the country. Um, so we're going to get back. There's lots more I want to hear about, including yeah. not just the challenges businesses like yours have faced, but what we can do about it, especially using innovative development finance tools. Um, but let's get uh, Jean-Paul or, or JP uh, in the conversation. JP, you're joining us from the Seychelles. Uh, let's just make sure your camera is on and your microphone is on. Uh, but I'd love to hear, you know, Africa is a continent. There are many countries. It's hard to give an overview, but that is your job over at the UN Economic Commission for Africa. Maybe you can give us a sense of, of what you're seeing in terms of small and medium enterprises in the country and the challenges that they're facing in the continent in general and the challenges they're facing. Thanks very much, uh, Raj, and good afternoon from Seychelles. Good morning to you uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, it's a great pleasure to join you uh, today. I hope you can hear me well. 
We do. Uh, in relation to the situation in Africa, I think to understand the context first, um, it's important to understand that Africa faces very particular vulnerabilities. And consequently, the response to the COVID-19 uh, situation has, uh, has been as urgent for, as, as for any other region. Uh, but the tools that are at the disposal of African governments and of organizations that are involved in Africa have not been the same. Um, the main issue, for example, is the lack of fiscal space. Most African countries are, are running budgets that are very tight. They don't have a huge amount of stimulus that they can, they can pump into the economy. And the stimulus that they do have is going very understandably, first and foremost, into the healthcare response. So it's going into the front line. It's going to the uh, procurement of uh, PPE and of medical equipment and of uh, human resources to deal with the, immediate, the immediacy of the crisis. So there is a real impact on jobs and on SMEs in particular. 71% um, of, African, of the African workforce is actually in the informal sector. Uh, and this is, uh, again, linked to the structural nature of, of Africa's economy. Uh, we should note that there's relatively weak institutions, uh, weak regulations. On the plus side, Africa has been doing relatively well up until this crisis. Uh, growth has been sustained over a significant period of time. Of course, you have the conflict areas, but in other areas, growth has been sustained and has been positive, and it's translated into a growing middle class. So that feel-good story has been really disrupted uh, in this circumstance because a lot of these people who had reached that sort of uh, had left extreme poverty, they're now back on the edge. And the work that the UNACA has, has done uh, has estimated that 29 million people may descend into extreme poverty immediately linked to COVID-19. And a lot of these people, uh, the, the issue is linked to the informal sector and the precarity of their, of their employment, which is obviously linked to supply chains which have been disrupted. So in terms of the response, um, I think this came out in the poll in the context of Africa, the first response that needs, that's needed is fiscal stimulus. And Africa needs support for that. It cannot come only from the governments. And the UNECA has uh, uh, estimated that the immediate needs is $100 billion, which sounds like a lot until you realize that uh, I think the US is looking at just $60 billion just for airlines. So in the context of, of what Africa need, needs, it sounds like a lot, but actually in the context of the number of countries, it's not. So in terms of uh, following that immediate response, a few of the areas that we're looking really as priority is the food, energy, water nexus. Uh, so it means investing in the food supply network. This can help build SMEs uh, while at the same time ensuring that there is the immediate need of food. And, and uh, it was very interesting to hear Vipul's experience in India, which is not necessarily so different from the African experience, but the infrastructure that is needed is, is, is more significant. And there needs to be simultaneous investment in the base infrastructure as well as in building up the economic capacity to deal with that. Uh, in terms it's of energy- It's interesting you use the word nexus because those three things yeah. are very connected, right? You can't necessarily yeah. see food production stabilized if you don't have the energy or you don't have the, the water resources. It, exactly, exactly. There are a lot of nascent SMEs in Africa. Um, we've done, for example, we did a, a workshop early in February before COVID-19 in Zimbabwe, where we were engaging with young entrepreneurs who had laptops, who had mobile phones, but the problem was they couldn't guarantee that they had electricity. Uh, they couldn't guarantee that they would have access to the network at the right time. So electricity, uh, electricity provision, there's a huge gap still in Africa. Uh, and by, by uh, bridging that gap, we empower a whole new generation of entrepreneurs. And we also ensure inclusion and, and tapping into, uh, for example, ensuring that women entrepreneurs and, and young girls have access uh, uh, to the market. And the, the water and sanitation element is absolutely critical as well, because a huge proportion uh, of Africans uh, live in slums. 34% uh, of actually of, of Africans do not have access to washing facilities in their homes. Uh, and this is obviously a big issue in terms of the immediate response to COVID-19, but it's also critical for building a business. Um, if you're going to be in food production, for example, you need to have access to, to water, you need to ac have access to sanitation to ensure the value of your business and, and of, uh, of your investments. Yeah, yes, yeah, been listening to JP, I can't help but think those were all uh, infrastructure deficits. They were all needs that we had long before this pandemic, right? The lack of access mm -hmm. to clean water or energy. And they all sound like things that take some time to invest in and move. And you're getting phone calls, presumably from your 1200 portfolio company saying, hey, we need you know, on your three points of preserve and strengthen and ensure health and food. We need emergency assistance here. 
Um, you know, John Paul also talked about how the, the international community has got to step in from a fiscal standpoint. So far, it's been mostly about debt, uh, you know, debt suspension of payments and things like that. Uh, you've got some tools in the development finance institutions like CDC Group to do mm -hmm. other things. Like what are some of the tools you have? What are you doing when you get those phone calls from your portfolio companies to really help them uh, according to those three pillars you laid out? Yeah, so we have um, two specific investment portfolios that I'll talk about. One is called Growth and one is called Catalyst. We have also got a technical assistance facility called CDC Plus, and then we have non-financial support that comes from our impact groups. I can speak across those four sets of tools. Um, and I'm actually really grateful to be at an institution that has that, that supply of tools because this, this allows us to respond to a greater set of needs. So the growth capital, that is our traditional kind of private equity debt um, and fund investments that go in for economic development, what we've always done and what we will continue to do. Um, Catalyst is where we have the potential to take a flexible approach to risk in exchange for what we would in normal circumstances describe as market shaping opportunities, where we would be testing untested business models or company, working with companies that are trying to reach out to new customer bases that haven't yet been served. Um, that's what Catalyst would do in a normal environment. In an environment like this, we can also leverage that tool to go after um, segments where the COVID impact translates to a certain type of risk that probably wouldn't suit our growth capital, and we can use the Catalyst toolkit to, to respond well in that, in that regard. Um, the technical assistance facility has also set up two specific facilities right now. One is for emergency technical assistance and helping our companies to navigate the crisis. And the other is a business response facility that, that aligns nicely to the strengthen pillar, which is really about helping to support companies. So either with investment or with technical assistance that can actually step up and, and, and contribute to a response to COVID-19 in their country. And then finally, with um, there, there is just a lot of demand for guidance and advice. Um, from our portfolio or from co-investors or partners in the market. So we have um, a long list actually available on our website of guidance notes that we have been working to produce from our own team's expertise, but also in partnership with others. Um, and then we have also got a, uh, you know, a set of webinars that we that we've hosted to help get that get the, that advice out there into the market as well. I think the most important thing is that, you know, we are backed by a shareholder that has a very long-term approach. Um, and so we are not- And just so people by... know, your shareholder is the Department for International Development in the UK, right? The UK government ministry- uh, Correct. Charged Which with is, development. at the end of the day, the taxpayer. Um, and you know, I think everyone at CDC keeps that in mind every day and works with a, a significant responsibility to that shareholder. Um, but also is grateful for the flexibility that brings. And that, that means that we can take a longer term horizon when we're making these investments and supporting these companies. And, and that means that we have a responsibility to step into the domain where others don't, don't have that leisure. You know, we're, get, we're starting to get questions in, Yasmin. I thought one, one really uh, piggybacks nicely on what you've been talking about. And I'm sure we have people joining us from other development finance institutions and they wanna know, you know, what are some of the internal roadblocks, right? You, you've gone from an institution that has certain portfolios and funds like you described, uh, TA and other things, and now suddenly you're facing this crisis. How have you kind of gotten through the internal roadblocks to move and shift and change and adapt to the, the current crisis we're, we're facing? Yeah, that's a really important question. Um, so I, I'm really grateful because we spent a lot of time in 2019 actually laying out what Catalyst is and what growth is, and we have all the toolkit in place now to use that well. Um, and early on in the crisis, there was a question as to whether we should just say everything that's COVID response would be Catalyst, and isn't this all high risk, and shouldn't this just go into that bucket? And I was pretty quick to say, no, we're not throwing out all the hard work we've just completed, but actually it's a good test to check that we defined things well then, and can we still use those definitions now? And we've we've just completed an assessment that actually, yeah, we're not we're not feeling constrained with the tools that we have today. We're not turning down things that we should that we feel we should be doing, which is a nice place to be. So it feels like we have enough flexibility in the toolkit. Then in terms of process, it is important to say that I think you know we were very quick to set up an express investment committee so that we could take quick decisions on things 
especially with existing portfolio companies, if they needed an additional loan or they wanted to reconsider the structure of their financing or things like that, that we could be very quick to act in that regard. Um, normally, you know, we have processes like you need to submit an IC paper a week before the meeting, all kinds of things. The team just went into extreme response mode and, um, you know, everyone working very hard and trying to be extremely uh, responsive and quick and adaptive to, to the, the needs of the companies that were, that were coming forward. Yeah, as Vipul described, you know, government re restrictions or requirements at a time like this can be a challenge. If you know, and, and those those may be there for good reasons during normal times, but at a moment like this, it's particularly tough. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think the other the other dimension that's really important and will be with us for some time is the fact that due diligence changes in nature when you can't meet people in person. Um, and so we're working now to define what does remote due diligence look like for CDC and how do we gain reliance on what's, what types of things could be sufficient for us. So that's a live exercise right now. And then the other thing that I wanted to come back to that I think both Vipul and Jean-Paul touched on um, that I find really interesting right now is the role of the public sector, especially in these markets where the fiscal response is constrained, as Jean-Paul said, is changing. So normally the domain of the public sector is kind of this preserved space and the public, the private sector is over here, right? And these are two separate entities that intertwine at times, but really operate, you know, alongside of each other instead of interdependently. Um, and I think that's starting to change the way Vipul talked about needing to work with the government. Um, and then if the government just cannot operate beyond a certain set of constraints, you know, what is the changing role of UN agencies or the private sector? I, I just thought I would throw that question to to my panelists. As well. Yeah, it, it is a fascinating one, right? Like some of the, the lines are being blurred because, you know, if you're running a government, uh, you've got to make sure food is getting to people. You know, you need to think differently, maybe. You can't just, you know, rely on the, the set of regulations and policies that were in place in the past. Um, I wonder, Vipul, if we could get you into this discussion because uh, I'm guessing you're growing, right? You're out there trying to deliver food at a moment when people yes. need a service like that. Maybe you need more financing. Maybe you've been out uh, fundraising. What is that like to do at a moment like this from the likes of CDC Group? So, so Yasmin was talking about, you know, diligence, and I have been trying to raise capital for my company. And I'm realizing now the challenges of doing remote diligence. And uh, it's not funny, let me tell you, when you're on the other side, uh, because, you know, we, we are talking to a UK based investor, for example, and they said, you know, I don't know when I can travel to India again. So, how do we do diligence? And I said, I'll do one thing I'll put somebody with a, you know, a drone camera and make sure that you walk him around the entire uh, our stores or our uh, fulfillment centers and you can actually ask questions and somebody will, uh, and I can answer it sitting on the other side and all of us can then go through it if we really want to make a site visit. So we are, we are really trying to come up with some very interesting and very unique uh, solutions which you never thought were uh, going to happen. But I, I and is it working, Vipul? Are you are you able to are you going to be able to get the financing you need quickly enough in a crisis like this? I, I think so. I think so. I, I think the jury is still out whether it's working efficiently and quickly enough. And we are learning as we go along. These are still early days, but I, I think we'll find a solution. And I think there is enough uh, you know uh, concern and interest on both sides to make it work. So I think we will find a solution which eventually uh, works for everybody. Uh, the other side is also very interesting. You know. Uh, uh, Yakmin talk about this private versus public boundaries getting blurred. And one of the things that we have realized, and, and this we realized is when we got in this business uh, almost about a decade back, is that you have to play a public role. Like it or not, uh, your role is not just limited to being a private company where you can say, okay, my job is to my investors, and I just make sure that I get the best gross margin and I take care of it and I deliver it, and I really don't care about anything else. Uh, we got in the business, we told our investors very early on, I think almost about six years back, saying that one of the th roles that we'll have to play in India, if we want to be uh, really make this work, is to actually uplift the entire supply chain that we have, which includes our people who deliver, the people who pick and pack, the suppliers that we work with. So we actually set up a trust uh, for, our, uh, for our employees. And this is a trust where we raised a series C, we told our investors, we are setting aside a million dollars, which is all we could afford those days. And he said, we'll set aside a million dollars. And this million dollars will actually, the company can't touch it anymore. It's outside the company, sitting in, in an independent trust. And this will be used to actually only educate people to provide them medical insurance over and beyond what the company provides. And also to help them if they uh, you know, reach a stage where they need financial assistance. The guy wants to buy a house. Uh, his uh, brother wants to get educated. 
his wife uh, wants to learn a, acquire a particular skill and we said we'll use this capital only to do that we are now realize that's been so you know important for us we are now expanding it to actually in fact we are providing covid insurance uh, to all our employees across uh, which is extremely generous and we said we'll fund it through the trust again and so we're using that now to actually extend you know, we are now talking of extending that to all the farmers that work with us so providing insurance health insurance covid insurance to farmers education assistance to farmers and their progeny uh, during this period and so therefore i think it is important for private enterprise also to realize that uh, particularly in times like these there is a very significant overlap between the public and the private space and you have to play that role if you want to uh, succeed in any business and that's one of the reasons why we have been able to buy, uh, bounce back raj as a lot of our employees have come back today and are still wanting to come back and work with us and are working hard even in these times primarily because they see a long term responsibility towards the company and they see okay this is a company which has stood by me has uh, has professed uh, you know care for me and my family and therefore i owe something back to the company yeah and i i wonder because we're getting a lot of questions in you can see my visitor here eduardo joining us um <laughs> i wonder because we're getting questions in about vulnerable communities and i'm thinking about the farmers you talked about right. um who may be at the very beginning of the supply chain and uh, many migrant workers as you say who work in some of these right. packing facilities really. i mean these are people who may not really have a safety net at all yes. um yes. and they might be particularly vulnerable in a moment like this uh, what what are what are companies doing what are governments doing and what can development finance institutions do we had that that question about job protection it was pretty low in the in the numbers in that first poll but i'm just curious you know what do you think we pull from your standpoint we can or should do differently now when we think about the vulnerable communities that are that are likely to be affected by this i think there are three things that we are realizing one i think we need to step up investment uh, if you need to you know take care of some of these things so for example one of the things that we are now working towards and saying is there a wage guarantee we can give so for example there are a lot of our employees who are not able to join back work and who cannot uh, because they're locked down the family is not well and and we we feel that it's not fair for us to actually deny them salary they may have exhausted all their leave so they don't have any more leave left is there a way that at least we can provide them a minimum wage during this period which may be 1/3 1/4 of what or at least provide them food and groceries during this period so we have set up a helpline for all our employees saying that even the ones who have left us and saying you can actually call back groceries we will deliver Uh, we'll del- if you can pay great if you can't pay we will the company will uh, take this expense and fund this so really reaching out uh, particularly to your employee base and we have about 25000 people uh, so it's a large base uh, and this is just direct employee directly employed by us and so we said you know let's reach out to partners uh, to smaller firms which supply to us we we are asking them saying what help do you need to get started do you need working capital advance from our side do we need us to pay you Uh, let's say two months of uh, supplies ahead so that you can start off again because you've been shut down there is no way you can start off uh, do you need us to train your people and your pets and and uh, sanitize your facilities because most of them don't even know what to do next they don't understand how do i make my <laughs> factory safe again what measures do i need to implement so we have we have learned ourselves and now we are sort of providing them training and reaching out and tra- training them saying this is the way to actually restart your factory these are the kind of sanitization processes you need to follow uh, these are the things that if you do your employees will be safe these are the mandatory checks and balances that you need to build into your system so really investing in training investing in uh, providing a, some sort of minimum security and food to people uh, within the people who uh, work with us directly or indirectly this is the first step i believe and there's yep. a lot more we can do but i think this is where we have got started with You know, the, we've got so many important threads that have come out in the discussion so far. I'm going to go to JP uh, for for his take on a number of those and a particular question because we're getting lots of great questions that are coming in from those of you who are joining us. Thank you for being with us. And before we hear from you, JP, I just want to ask the producers to throw up our second poll question uh, as time is moving quickly in this conversation. I want to make sure we have time to get to to it. Um, and while that poll question is up, JP, let me ask you to just talk um, as people take a look at this question. Uh, you know one of the one of the issues that has come through from our audience is about debt cancellation you talked a little bit about fiscal stimulus we talked a little bit about debt cancellation what do you want to actually see uh, the international community doing in terms of providing the kind of fiscal support either to governments or to businesses um, on the african continent what do you want to see done 
Thanks a lot. I think I think that's that comes to the crux of the issue. And first of all, uh, we have to understand the scale of the gap that was already there even before COVID, right? Uh, the, the UNECA, we had calculated that to achieve the sustainable development goals in Africa, uh, you needed $63.8 billion per year. Uh, and and that, that, that gap was there already. That was, the, that was the, the, sco- the, the scale of the gap that existed even before COVID. And we've redone that calculation post-COVID and it's now $92.8 billion uh, per year. So the wow. financing gap was already very significant. Um, and a lot of that gap can be taken on by the private sector. But in the context of Africa, and I think this, this came up in previous discussions, that uh, a lot of that uh, also needs to come from, from direct aid. I mean, there's no, there's no skirting around the issue because in terms of some of the infrastructural projects, some of them can be done as public-private partnerships, but some of it needs to come in as real financing to create a framework that allows other investment to take place and allows the, the private sector to flourish. Well, and it's worth we... mentioning, JP, and, and I just want to interrupt for a second um, to say to people to finish answering that poll, we're going we're gonna to take it down now and see what the results are. Uh, we asked you what's, what, the, what do you think has been most damaging um, to small businesses during this, during this crisis, and we'll see what the results are on that. But JP, one reason just to underline why African uh, countries, many African countries, aren't in a position to finance this themselves is they are either heavily reliant on exports of energy products, oil and gas, minerals, or other commodities, which have all seen their prices just plummet during the crisis, or they're heavily reliant on tourism. And of course, people aren't traveling. So you know, some of the core sources of government revenue have really dried up, and that's why fiscal stimulus is so, is so, so important. Um, and you know, that, that's a, a challenge governments are facing at the same time that businesses are facing what you're seeing up here on the screen, a combination of lockdowns, um, as well as supply chain disruption and consumer spending dropping uh, and then lack of access to money. Um, so thank you all for, for answering uh, that, th- that poll. Um, th- those lockdowns are a significant challenges, a challenge for businesses. But JP, continue on, on this theme of what do you want to see the international community do uh, to help bridge that gap, that 90 plus billion dollar annual gap that, that you now see to, to reach the SDGs? Well, I think that the, uh, first of all, the, the debt, a debt standstill in the first instance gives immediate fiscal space. So that's the first thing that we've asked for. In terms of debt cancellation, it may be different for different countries because we do have to recognize that there are different experiences. Uh, there are some countries that are, sur- that are saddled with unsustainable debt, and there are different reasons behind that. There have been conflicts. There have been other uh, aspects. And in, and in many of those countries, we've just got to accept that a debt cancellation is probably the best way to actually be able to move towards sustainability. And we need to recognize that by going in that direction, we'll create new demand, we'll create new opportunities, we'll create new growth uh, uh, options. Um, and, and we're not uh, there yet. I mean, just, 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 I don't want to suggest no. people when I use the word debt, that debt cancellation is there. All that's been agreed to, as I understand at this point, is suspension of debt payments. Suspension, exactly. Right, exactly. which means the debt is still due, the interest is even still due. It's just due Correct. later. Um, Correct. And, and we it know creates... this is potentially a long-term crisis. Exactly. And, and I think that that's, that's necessary in the first instance, a debt, a debt standstill, uh, which allows countries to take the money that they were previously uh, uh, sending out of the country and to put it into their immediate response. And as you pointed out, you see the earnings of African countries are very significantly down. The tax base is already low in many of these countries. They're dependent on exports. Um, uh, I think about 40% of African uh, exports are commodity uh, driven and particularly around oil and gas. And with the de- the depression in those prices, earnings are significantly lower. And there's a vicious circle. Uh, the currency depreciates, so it costs them more to service their debt, uh, while at the same time they're earning less in relation to their ability to service. So, so the debt issue is part of the equation. But the other part of, the, of that angle is in terms of, uh, first of all, the options for, for private sector investment. And the good news is that African countries are very open to that. Uh, in the ECA, we actually have an SDG 7 initiative. SDG 7 concerns energy. So we have a large number of actually shovel-ready uh, projects. We're in conversations with CDC actually about this, about investing, uh, about creating the framework for investors to be able to invest in renewables, but also in terms of efficiencies, because you can also gain energy benefits by improving the efficiency of, of all the technologies and by investing in, in, uh, in new, new technologies. There's opportunities as well for uh, hybrids in terms of, of bonds, for example, uh, SDG bonds are a potential opportunity. 
uh, where you can raise money, which is partly from the private sector, but perhaps blended in terms of finance that uh, could be in through the form of sovereign guarantees or through the form of guarantees from international institutions to mobilize new money that goes uh, into uh, the fight against COVID, but also addressing the impact, for example, of climate change. Uh, we don't realize because we factored it into our everyday lives, but climate change is already impacting to two to three percent every year on African economies. African economies are losing, losing between two to three percent, and in some outliers, up to ten percent of GDP on issues affecting uh, linked to climate change. If we take uh, Southern Africa around uh, Zimbabwe, Zambia, uh, they were affected with a severe drought recently, and that led to three hundred percent loss in terms of their energy generation because they were depending on hydropower linked to the Lake Kariba Dam, just to give an example. So uh, the, the huge impact of climate change is happening at the same time as the impact of COVID. And the response needs to also address those structural constraints. So investing in energy is one of the key ways that we can link up with the private sector. In food production networks as well, there's a lot of scope for investment, uh, not only in terms of the infrastructure, but in terms of the production network, which includes in terms of inputs, things like fertilizer, uh, it also involves the infrastructure around it, whether it be roads, uh, whether it be the transportation and logistical networks, warehouses, coal stores, the value chain. All of this is areas that investment can come in uh, through the private sector with support from the, from the public sector. Yasmin, I want, want to get you into the conversation. Go ahead and jump in with what you want to say. And then there are many <laughs> great questions coming in. I've got to hit you with a couple of them, but go ahead. Tell us what you think. I was going to pick up on what Jean-Paul said with respect to blended finance. And you know, I think there, there's been a movement around blended finance in recent years, notwithstanding. And then in this context, I think there's a, a very clear spotlight shining on the opportunity that that can provide. So when we're looking at facilities in particular with respect to putting liquidity into the market, um, you know, whether it's a fund structure or if it's a risk share with a bank, for example, um, there, there are several different types of investment structures that would really benefit from someone coming in at the first loss piece. And I think there is uh, you know, another place where we're seeing the, the blending of roles between the, in that case, it would be the more philanthropic or donor money coming together with investment capital uh, to respond to some of the things Jean Paul was saying. Yeah, you, you know, your CEO, Nick O'Donohoe, has a, a great op-ed in DevX just a couple of days ago that I'd really recommend to people. We can share it in the description. Um, because it really gets into some of the many ways the DFIs can respond. And one of them is about shoring up uh, the local banks, um, mm -hmm. which do have a direct connection often to the, to the SMEs. And if those banks are strong, and maybe it's through a blended finance approach that those banks can have the money to get out, uh, you may be able to see more of a fiscal response to the private sector. Uh, yes, we ha we've had a number of questions come in. Let, let me ask you about um, female entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs. Um, mm -hmm. It's been this has been a priority area for a lot of DFIs, um, but now we're in this crisis situation. What are you doing to ensure that women get the access to finance that they need to either preserve or strengthen uh, their business? Well, we've had a gender focus in our impact priorities for a couple of years already. We signed up to the two X challenge with partner DFIs a couple of years ago. And now with respect to the COVID crisis, there is already an, initi an, an initiative across those DFIs, um, 15 of them, I think, putting together a statement to outline what the negative impacts of COVID would look like on, uh, on the population of women across entrepreneurs, but also as employees and business owners um, uh, and, and people working across the supply chain. If, if we're not paying attention. I think it's recognized that the women, uh, women in the context of COVID are a disproportionate, are, are a population that will be disproportionately affected. And so um, we have been highlighting gender risks as part of the job protection guidance that we put out. We have um, been working with companies in our portfolio that has disproportionately large um, segments of their employee base that are women to think very proactively about how we can help support their um, dynamic response to changing needs of their workforce. And in particular thinking as well about the longer term um, needs for those workforce. So, it's, you know, I think in the early days of the crisis, it was probably natural. And I think this is probably common across developed and developing economies to think, oh, you know, what, what is this crisis? We need to go into protection mode and, and cut costs and we're gonna have to survive and you, you go really straight to survival mode. 
Um, and it was actually really great to engage in a dialogue with portfolio companies who started to say, well, actually, we, we've worked hard to train this staff. And what can we do that's more adaptive in response instead of just kind of black and white, you know, we have this number of staff or that number of staff. Well, can we just say, could we change maybe the way the salaries are being paid out? Or could we say we're going to kind of, um, you know, utilize this portion and put this portion maybe on hold? I think that Paul was speaking a little bit about that too. And and rebalance the way that the workforce is being utilized so that we can actually preserve it and come back to it when we're ready to scale back up again and not lose the investment in that workforce that we've made, especially when they're women. Um, and so I think with respect to the employee segment, we're, think, we're seeing it come up in, in those types of ways. With respect to access to finance, I mean, that was a problem prior to the crisis. It's probably you know exacerbated now. And I think it's, it's um, front and center on our minds, as, as I'm sure with, with many other investors today. Yeah, and it could be exacerbated by the distance. You know, we talked about trying to do due diligence by video or, you know, sending around a drone camera. I think a lot mm -hmm. of women who, who are entrepreneurs have suffered from the network effect when you're looking to finance, right? And, and you know someone at this financial institution or that financial institution. And if you don't, if you're not in that network, it can be hard to get the money. And I can see that problem being uh, compounded right now. Uh, when you can't get face-to-face -face meetings, you can't break through, you can't go to networking events or conferences the way that, that you could have um, you know, just a short while ago. That's possible, but I think there could also be positive outcomes. So in a way, having remote interactions makes everything more formal. You don't have the, hey, let's go to the pub afterwards type of thing where some of those True. opportunities historically came up, right? And so if you are more formal and engaged, actually maybe it, it levels the playing field in a way that's a positive outcome. That's a great point. And I, and I do want to get to, before we wrap up the discussion, we still have a little bit of time left. I do want to get to some of the possible positive outcomes, but I'm struck, you know, we've got the title here in, in Chris's great illustration. We're talking about times of disruption and there are many layers of disruption. And one of them that we haven't really gotten to is presumably the, the lockdown. We asked the poll question and the lockdown is the biggest challenge. He's benefiting some businesses, maybe big baskets, an example, um, you know, businesses that are digital, businesses that are connected to uh, larger networks that can have delivery service that have, that have strong supply chains, but it might hurt other businesses, right? It might, it might actually impact a lot of other kinds of companies that are out there, maybe including some that are in your, your portfolio at CDC. I'm, I'm curious from all of your standpoints, how you see this issue of disruption, maybe an accelerating disruption of trends that existed even before affecting small and mid-sized businesses in the context where you work. Anybody wanna jump into that question? I'll start. Um, I think we have a few exciting companies that are are stepping up at this stage and doing really interesting things. So we have a company in the portfolio of one of the venture funds in India that we've invested in, and it's called Niramai. And its product prior to COVID was an um, artificial intelligence-based breast cancer screening tool, non-invasive. And right now they're looking at whether they can adapt the technologies that they've been developing to think about fever related COVID diagnostics. And it could be a tool, for example, it wouldn't probably be at a medical grade, but it could be a tool that offices could utilize to, to scan workers as they come in the door. Um, so I think that that kind of um, pivot or, or addition of new products that companies could be developing in response to this stage. And, and not just for the, the next three months, right? I think this is the type of thing that could be utilized over the longer term for more purposes. Um, I think those kinds of disruptions are quite interesting. We are seeing a lot of food companies, for example, launch health-based products because these are suddenly in demand and consumers have become a lot more health conscious. Uh, uh, so a lot of traditional uh, you know, uh, CPG companies uh, who had, did not have a health portfolio have launched a whole host of New health products. Uh, yeah, give us an example. What kind of what kind of health products are these uh, consumer packaged uh, good companies so these providing? Are, you know, uh, Indians believe a lot in these Ayurvedic uh, formulations. So you have a lot of products based health uh, based immune system. Uh, uh, you know, which develop your immune system uh, products based on that, uh, which help you, or actually the ones which you, you know you can re take to reduce your weight or uh, manage your uh, blood sugars or manage your uh, you know blood pressure, all of that. And so there are a lot of natural products. And people are now, and those are becoming a lot more mainstream suddenly. And these sort of used to you know, exist on the periphery. In fact, uh, somebody like Big Basket would carry them, but most grocers would not because they would carry a very sm small selection. 
and now we are finding that uh, the range of these products has expanded a lot more companies are offering these products now and some of the large companies are actually started uh, launching them under their label and mm-hmm. these have become a large uh, you know growing category so that's an interesting side effect of what's happening obviously the other one is look uh, but maybe the prices of ginger and turmeric are going through the roof i, I don't know <laughs> actually not right now because i think uh, you know the supply is large and demand is uh, subdued because farmers don't uh, can't access markets so the the market prices are still pretty low jean paul what do you see in terms of disruption in the african continent you know it's a continent that already has been leading in many ways in the digital revolution with innovative finance and uh, financial inclusion models um and a lot of connectivity growing connectivity what what do you see happening there Well I think on the plus side there's been a lot of great innovation I mean we've already seen in terms of the response to covid there've been a number of companies that have literally uh transformed themselves either they've moved from other sectors and they've started doing PPE they've started making masks uh we've 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 seen that in Senegal we've seen that in Tunisia uh we've seen a number of of I would say good stories that have emerged but I think that we despite that positive angle and, and there's also the growth of of e-commerce uh, uh, most countries already had strong for example mobile phone banking uh, options uh, this is particularly prevalent in east africa and this has been used a lot uh, during the crisis to transfer funds as well to even needed people who are who were needed support in the in the immediate but we need to look at as well the, the again the lack of the lack of resilience uh, at the core of of african uh, uh, businesses and this is linked to for example the loss of spending power in africa is more immediate whereas you'll have a stronger social protection system you'll have uh, savings you in in for example the developed world in africa those are not as strong uh, so immediately the lack of purchasing power in the domestic economy has an immediate impact and you've got a number of of industries that were doing really well if i take the example of you of uh, ethiopia the export of fresh flowers um this has been severely disrupted uh because of the the changes in in, in flights the lack of availability uh, in terms of export markets but even the supply chain because ethiopia depends on inputs that come from around the continent uh it depends on inputs that are coming through djibouti that are coming through kenya and the the disruption in the smes that often provide these inputs uh, has led to the uh, disruptions in, in in that context in the country where i'm from and where i am at the moment in seychelles uh there's been a boost for the demand for example for tuna in terms of exports there's a lot of demand that's coming up but unemployment is low in seychelles and traditionally in seasons where they had increased demand they would actually import labor from madagascar from kenya and they can't do that right now so there there is that integration that actually was happening in the african economy which is a very positive thing which has really been impacted by covid-19 and we need to reinforce the the capacity of value chains to adapt uh which means look looking at uh more local and regional uh resilience models and how they can feed into each other uh as well as uh recognizing that you can't get away from the the need for having some form of social protection a uh, framework to be uh reinforced uh in in the continent and that last poll question we had you know the number one response was that it's the lockdowns that are affecting business and you just gave a number of great examples of why that is actually the case and uh you know one of the reasons that comes to mind first for people might be oh well, your employees can't leave and your consumers can't leave their home but another big one that you've highlighted is um you know mig- migratory workers people who uh, have to travel uh, to work and when that's shut down or slowed down as we've all described as well within india uh, it can have huge huge ripple effects um you know i want to try to get to some more of the the great questions that we're getting in and uh, yes mean i one for you at cdc which is about you know you talked of of funding the health sector and the food security issues what about directly supporting um public sector funded projects like hospitals and healthcare facilities uh in Africa and and in other low income uh environments is that is that something CDC group is is looking to do or interested to do given the crisis so we do have a portfolio of hospitals and um they tend to be private hospitals as opposed to part of a public health care system that's historically been the place where we can make investments um today i don't know how that landscape is changing if those lines are blurring um that's quite an interesting dynamic to learn more about it's not something that's in our portfolio today so i i don't really um know what more i can say on it now but i think um what what we are seeing is naturally 
the public healthcare system is looking to private hospitals to incorporate them as part of the response. And so where there have been opportunities for our portfolio company hospitals to, to engage in that dialogue, they are, they are stepping into that, that conversation quite proactively. Got it. We had a similar question in a way, which is about the role of uh, nonprofits, of, not, of NGOs. Um, you know, often NGOs are working with networks of businesses, often very small businesses at the local level. We haven't talked about the, the NGOs, either international or national. What, what would you like to see them do as part of this ecosystem that supports the, the supply chains and the small and medium sized enterprises um, in the context where you all work? Perhaps uh, I can start on this one, uh, Raj, if that's okay. I think the, we, we've been advocating a whole of society approach uh, in terms of building back better. And that means that it's not just government led. Government has a key role to play in terms of particularly the regulatory frameworks and in creating the enabling environment for uh, the stimulus to be, to be distributed equitably and also to have the maximum impact. Uh, but it has to be, the needs need to come from a wider consultation with society. Um, there is a tendency, not only if we take it in Africa, there's a tendency even elsewhere, that uh, stimulus tends to gravitate towards vested interests and lobbies. And we want to avoid that. And I think there's a great role for civil society to play in enhancing the transparency in following the money. There's a lot of good examples around the African continent where NGOs have been involved, for example, in increasing budget transparency, in looking at where money is going into projects and that these projects are actually being delivered. Doing uh, in Nigeria, there's some examples where they've looked at before and after uh, evidence, uh, photographs that have been done using social media, um, making sure that money is actually being invested in the public infrastructure that it's supposed to be uh, invested in. And in the context of sustainability, ensuring that we're actually going towards a green recovery, we should not be further subsidizing inefficient uh, fossil fuel based industries, for example, that are already over subsidized. And we should, uh, on the contrary, be promoting investments uh, that, that will generate more uh, sustainable incomes. Uh, in renewable energy, for example, just based on existing commitments pre-COVID-19, uh, over 567,000 additional jobs will be created around renewable energy up until 2022. That's just, that's just that's under two years. Uh, so that's just in that period. Now, if we can upscale those investments, we can dramatically increase the, the job creation around, uh, for, and, and energy is a is a, a ready to go uh, element because you know there's there's a lot of private sector investment that can be lined up. There are other areas where it's more where it's more complicated. Food production, it's a little bit more complicated, but it's doable. Uh, and I think that the the role has to be around making sure that the finance goes to the right place. And I think civil society has a key role in highlighting where the where the money will have the most impact. Yeah, and I would add that I think that it's really important to remember what the roles, I mean, we talked earlier about the blurring of roles between public, private sector, philanthropic, NGO, um, but I, I still think there are places where different types of institutions are best placed to be the right actor, and it's really important that CDC is not trying to solve everything and across, you know, across the piece, and we work very closely in partnership with our shareholder, the Department for International Development in the UK, which can provide international aid. And there are definitely segments of the response here which are not appropriate for investment. And aid is the right tool. And I would say the same with the humanitarian emergency response that international NGOs can put forward. And so, uh, you know, I think we, we think of ourselves as a piece of the system um, and, and the response of especially international NGOs is really important right now. Yes, but let me, let me take one of the questions we got and sort of adapt it to what you just said. Um, you know, DFIs have been growing a lot in recent years. Uh, all over the world, in the UK, but, but all over. Um, do you feel like they are well integrated into the broader ecosystem response, into the broader international aid response, the MDBs, the multilateral development banks like the World Bank and others? Is there enough clarity about what role development finance institutions should play and how it fits in to the broader response when, when we think about the pandemic? There is a significant amount of coordination. Um, the European development finance institutions have come together and then together with the IFC in the US. And um, there, are, there are so many different conversations, whether it's about how do we all think of the question of debt relief um, as, as in moratorium on payments, um, or how do we look at a specific sector, for example? So, so what are we thinking about supporting manufacturing and supply chains in terms of the needed healthcare products that will help countries respond to COVID-19? 
Um, and so across I think the development finance institutions across countries, there is that connectivity. And then within um, the different kind of adjacent universes, whether it's among impact investors or foundations and catalytic capital providers or um, the international NGOs, you know, those conversations are also happening often by sector and in, I think, quite tangible and, and, and pragmatic ways about what people can, can kind of build coalitions around and act on. So I think that's actually been um, quite quick to, to coalesce I want to try to get to a couple more questions. You know, we've got people joining us on uh, LinkedIn Live as well as YouTube Live. And, and one person on LinkedIn has asked us about the Caribbean. We haven't talked about that region yet. We've mostly focused on Africa and South Asia. Um, do these same themes apply in the Caribbean? The questioner is saying, hey, there's a lot of opportunities for agriculture in this region um, to be to be strengthened. Any thoughts from, from any of the panelists, maybe you, Yasmin, or others? We don't work in the Caribbean, so I'm not best placed to comment on that. Well, uh, I can speak from the perspective of coming from a, a personally coming from a small island developing state, which has a lot in common with the Caribbean countries. And I think the, the core vulnerability to external shocks is, is very strong. Um, a country, if we take the example of, of Seychelles, where I'm from, uh, the, the problem is the, the narrow resource base. Uh, Seychelles is very dependent on tourism. 38% of GDP is, is, is linked to tourism. And if you take the Caribbean, uh, the, 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 the reliance is similar. And we've seen that in the context of, of hurricanes uh, when they've happened in the Caribbean, the, the, the need to build back afterwards it, it is very challenging. There's huge loss of jobs and of, of, of incomes and COVID-19 is gonna have that same kind of, of impact. And, and I think it's important to look at the, the way in which you can build more, more resilient uh, sectors. It's, it's not easy because you're not, you're not working from a very large base. Uh, you know, in these kind of countries, you can't do a thousand things. Uh, and I think the opportunities for agriculture, for food production, which is locally based, which can feed the, the tourism sector is, is absolutely key, looking at organic production, because the production costs tend to be higher in smaller economies. But you can, you can factor that into your branding around uh, a positive experience, around uh, a healthy experience, around a, a clean uh, production, a circular economy, green economy kind of model. Uh, and one of the things that uh, I did when I was working with the Seychelles government uh, was we, we developed a blue bond, which actually attracted private sector finance with a guarantee from the World Bank, aimed at investing in uh, semi-industrial and artisanal fisheries. And the whole idea was to uh, recognize that we didn't want to increase the fishing effort, but we could create more sustainable incomes for people invo already involved in the fishing sector by getting them involved in more processing themselves. And that meant investing in coal stores. So the money that was generated was aimed particularly at increasing their input in the value chain and their participation in the value chain. And I think a lot of small island economies, that, that's where the focus needs to be on looking at uh, how you can empower your existing operators in the value chain and make them more resilient and get a higher value for the same product. Great points, and I'd love to come back to them if we have time, because I, I want to talk a little bit more about climate, but briefly, I'm gonna ask the producers to throw up the last question, the last poll question, which is what factor is mostly contributing to the fragility of jobs and markets in emerging markets? Um, we wanna understand wh where people think the fragility of jobs is coming from. And maybe at the same time, that's, a, that's an opportunity for me to ask Yasmin another question that we got in from our audience. Um, which is really about your portfolio companies and what they're doing when it comes to job protection. Um, you know, how have some of those portfolio companies dealt with needing to lay off people or needing to put people on furlough? Um, how have you seen that handled in your portfolio, Yasmin, as people answer this poll question? So uh, naturally, that's a sensitive question. I think it's fair to say that different companies are experiencing very different circumstances in this regard. Um, and, you know, I think for the most part, when we make an investment in a company, we have a very honest and open dialogue with them. And I'm sure people can attest to this about how the company should engage with a workforce you know, we have um, an environmental and social action plan put in place with, e which e with each investment that goes along with the impact thesis of our investment, which involves reference to job quality for the employees of the firm. And so from the start of our relationship with a company, we're very clear about what the expectations are about how employees should be treated, whether it's health and safety or, you know, from other quality aspects of, of employment. 
And so in this context, I think we benefit from having set the foundation of the conversation with, with our investee companies um, already with that tone. And um, so we, we, our partners are, um, are, are looking for the same things as us, which is to be responsible as employers, uh, because we wouldn't really be in an investment relationship with a company that didn't have that culture at its heart. And so, um, yes, they're facing tough decisions. Um, they're seeking guidance and we've put together this, um, well, job protection guidance and guidance for all different types of stakeholders, whether it's employers, investors or financial institutions who are putting money into these businesses. Um, what about customer protection, for example, in the context of COVID-19? How do you think about employees and protecting the customers in that kind of physical interaction they might be having? What about the construction sector? How do you handle a remote workforce? There's um, a, a guidance note about business integrity in this context as well. So there's been a significant engagement from the CDC impact group to put out this type of guidance to help support the companies. And then I think, as I said earlier, the companies are also working to think about the longer term. Yes, there is a significant hurdle to overcome in the short term. But when you're able to return to kind of full capacity of business, you don't want to lose the workforce that you've worked hard to train and recruit. So how can you adapt and, and accommodate in the interim? Well, let's look at the results of this poll if we can. Um, and then in the, in the remaining time we have, um, we're gonna hear a final thought from each of you. Uh, you, know, you can see it's, it's tough in my mind as well to think about you know, what are the many factors that make the situation so challenging, uh, so fragile, thinking of the flip side of resilience right now for jobs and for markets. And here we've got the plurality saying it's a lack of access to capital. But of course, there is still a third who say it's about the, the globalization and competition and interconnectivity. Um, so I wonder if we, could, if we could get a final thought from panelists about where they see things heading. And I maybe start with you, Vipul, because of this idea of of broader trends that were with us before we had this pandemic, maybe the pandemic is accelerating them, digitization, competition, globalization. Where do you see things heading, Nepal? Um, and what's, what are your final thoughts on, on this topic of building resilience during this time of disruption? There are three things which I think will be required for people like us to build a more resilient uh, business. I think fundamentally one, I think we'll have to invest more in infra. Uh, so we'll have to put more CapEx out uh, in building uh, more storage. For example, one of the biggest issues that farmers have had today is that they have excess production and there's nobody to buy and they don't have access to markets. Now we know those farmers, unfortunately, we don't have the storage facilities today to buy and store it. And so that is going to waste. So just investing in CAPEX for storage, in, investing in CAPEX to make sure that we are able to uh, provide fault tolerance will actually help everybody. The second part is will require more technology. Uh, if you need to handle very, very you know, uh, supply chains which are very variable and every element of the supply chain is varying. You need a lot more deployment technology to make sure that they are more efficient, that you can actually uh, reduce wastage and re react very, very quickly. And the third, I think, uh, investment that will be required is really in terms of uh, building resilience in people. And that will come from training, that will come from investments in health and safety. And if you do all these three, I think we'll build a more resilient business. Thanks for that, Vipul. Yeah, we've, we've now heard this theme of infrastructure from, from JP and from you, uh, technology investment. It's, it sounds like this is a moment to invest. Uh, what, what's your thought, your, your final thought about this issue? Sorry, was that towards me, Raj? It was to you. That was to you, Jean-Paul. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, what that's what fine. are your final thoughts? No, I, uh, firstly, I think, uh, as we've already said, the... Uh, we're in a situation where immediate response is needed. In the context of Africa, that means uh, in the immediate, it's, it's, it's financial resources in the very immediate. Uh, now, the way that financial resource stimulus is structured can help us address many of the problems that we had even before the crisis. Uh, if we structure it in the, in the right way, we're by investing in the right things, and I agree uh, with the priorities that Vipul has mentioned, you know, it's, it's about investing in the right infrastructure then creates a snowball effect. If you, if you invest uh, in, the, in the value chain of, of food production, which involves uh, the inputs into food production, as well as the infrastructure such, such as storage facilities, such as roads, and it's electricity and it's water. By investing in all of those uh, uh, elements, you create growth because you will create the environment for businesses to flourish of different sizes from the smaller ones to the, 
to the larger ones. Uh, but there has to be that investment, which is counter cyclical. Uh, we have to invest now at the point when maybe you, you're taking a risk. Uh, and we need the DFIs, I think, to, to lead that investment with the right structure from government. I agree as well with Yasmin, the point that she made before everyone has to understand their role. And the key role that governments have at the moment is to make sure that they have that right environment uh, to structure uh, those investments and ensure that there is accountability as well around those investments, that investments go into a, re a, a proper green recovery and not in maintaining uh, investments in, in sectors that have led to inequality, that have exacerbated inequality, that have exacerbated uh, environmental, uh, negative environmental uh, impacts and pollution, and rather foster that green recovery, recovery that we all want to see. Thanks very much. Thank you, JP. And you're so right. That while this is a huge challenge, there is an opportunity embedded in this as well. Um, Yasmin, a, a final thought from you. Yeah, so this is um, going to sound like it's coming out of left field, but <laughs> it's very much on my mind. So I'm going to use this forum to put it out there. I think um, I agree with Vipul that this is a moment where the ramp up of technology is going to be significant in whether it's managing supply chain volatility or um, even in health risk management, right? I mean, test, test, test is what the World Health Organization said, and that's all about collecting data. Uh, and so I think there's a great opportunity in having access to that data. And I think about, you know, how everything's gone digital, everything is online, connectivity is better than it's ever been. Um, we will have much better information that also involves a risk. And I just want to you know, put a shout out onto the privacy and surveillance uh, community. And I know there's a, there's a significant civil society voice that's, that's raising the alarm around this. Um, because I think now is a time in an emergency, it's easy to let, to take all the walls down and say, no, but we need to solve this. So, you know, put aside all the concerns and all the worries that we had, we need to get to the right answer. We, need to, we all need to survive. I mean, this is about survival. So, um, so let's surveil the the population and find out where the hotspots of outbreak are and you know and then afterwards it's very easy to just leave it in place um and so i i would just <laughs> i would just like to say i think there's a huge opportunity in the technology that will that will arrive in this moment but there's also a, a lot of risk and i think that risk was coming anyway um but it's it's probably accelerated now yeah, I think it's a great point. I'm glad you brought it on the table. You asked him and something we're covering at DevX, you know, you're seeing um, an acceleration of many of the trends that were with us before. And obviously privacy, data security were issues before, but things are moving really quickly now. Um, you know, day by day, week by week, decisions are being made that will be with us for a very, very long time. And I think that to JP's point, that comes down as well to what we invest in and what our priorities are. Um, and we got a little bit into that. I really appreciate the thoughts from all of you on what that future is going to look like. And in fact, we're going to be having another conversation uh, with the CDC group coming up. And that conversation is talking specifically about environmental uh, resilience. So uh, I, I want you all who are, who are watching this to stay tuned for it. Uh, environmental resilience post COVID-19, moving the needle on climate action. It's the week of June 15th. And it's part of a series of conversations we're doing with CDC Group because there really is, as JP said, a big opportunity here to not just get through this crisis, but reshape um, the economies that, uh, that are so important around the world to people's livelihoods and to long-term environmental resilience too. So I just want to say a big thanks to all of you. I learned a lot in this discussion. It went by really fast. I want to say a big thanks to everyone who joined us uh, from around the world and, and contributions. Stay tuned for more. Um, and we really appreciate it and stay safe wherever you are in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Thanks for having us. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you.